Hebrews chapter number 10. We're actually going to split the chapter in half because it's a larger chapter. We have uh, nearly 40 verses. There's 39 verses to be exact. So we're going to split the, the chapter in half. We're going to end uh, somewhere around 19, 20, 21, right around that uh, halfway point uh, when we have a kind of a seamless uh, stopping uh, point. So look here at Hebrews chapter number 10. We're going to begin reading in verse number 1. Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 1. The Bible says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Now one thing that we can learn from verse number one is how the word law is used. So when it says the law, sometimes you know the Bible is referring to the Ten Commandments. Sometimes it is referring to judgments and statutes and just in general commandments that God has given. But sometimes like here when it says the law it's just referring to the basic uh, uh, you know uh, uh, things of the Old Covenant that pertain to the Old Covenant that were given to Moses. Because if we look closely when it says the law, it goes on and says having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So notice that when it's talking about the law here, it's talking about the sacrifices. Now obviously that's not a specific commandment or that's not a specific judgment that God gave. This is just a part of the book of the law. It's a part of you know the first five books that Moses penned down and oftentimes that's what it is referred to as the book of the law and he will loosely use the, the phrase, the law, just to speak about you know, all of the, the uh, sacrifices, all of the different offerings that they were to come and to offer. But notice that it says this. It says, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things and then it goes on and says, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually and so forth and so forth. So, like we talked about last week, the Old Covenant is a picture. The Old Covenant in a major way is meant to be a picture of the New Covenant itself. And that's why it is the shadow. So the, so the Old Covenant actually, actually is what is the shadow. And furthermore, last week I preached about how there are many people out there that will teach that there's not a literal altar in heaven. And there's not, you know, all, all, all of the things that are explained as far as the, the candlesticks. All of these things, they'll say, well, those things, none of those things are literal. All these things are spiritual and they just represent spiritual things. But they would point to the physical on this earth and say, that's the literal. And the spiritual's in heaven. Well, the Bible actually reverses that. The Bible even here says that the Old Covenant, everything that had to do with the Old Covenant, everything that had to do with the tabernacle, everything that had to do with the sacrifices that were on this earth and all of that, everything that the law encompassed is actually the shadow. And it's the shadow of good things to come. And then it tells you it's not the very image of those things. So notice that there is an image. There's a, a, a something physical. There is something literal on this side. And the Old Covenant spiritually represented the literal or the physical. So you can see again how those people are in error when they say, oh, there's not really an altar. Oh, everything that was on earth in the Old Covenant, that was the physical, but what was in heaven is the spiritual. So we can see again how there's a major error there. But furthermore, and this is going to be a big theme of Hebrews chapter number 10, especially these first 20 verses, we're going to look at right now how the sacrifices were never able to take away sins. The sacrifices never did anything for man's sin. Did not, they did not improve his soul even one bit. And right here in verse number one, it tells you this. <clears throat> it says, can never, look at that word, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So, the high priest and the Israelites, they were commanded when they were given the law with their rituals and with their, their different ministries and their courses, they were commanded every year there was a time, as we, we looked at this in Hebrews 9, where the high priest went into the second tabernacle, where the high priest went into the holiest of all, went in within the veil, and he was to offer the blood for himself, but also the blood for others, the blood for Israel, uh, for their sins throughout that past year. But I want you to notice, we're given a very strong truth, a very you know, important truth. It's very significant. It tells us that those 
those uh, sacrifices and everything that was offered there, <clears throat> it says that they could never take away sin. It says, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers, the comers thereunto perfect. Now, what does it mean when it says perfect? It means complete. And what are you when you are not complete? That means you are lacking or you are wanting. So those things were not able to fix their problems. The blood of bulls and of goats were not able to fix their problems that they had, their sin problem. So it says they were never able to. Look at verse number 2. This is something that's harped on here. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. So notice there that it says, for then would they not have ceased to be offered. What is that implying? What is that saying? It's saying that if they were able to take away sins, if they had the power, if those sacrifices were able to save their soul or to take away all of their sins and give them forgiveness, then they, would have, they wouldn't have had to continually offer them. And that's the point why he, it seems redundant when he makes the statement in verse number one. It says they offered year by year continually. Well, he wanted to emphasize the fact that they went in every year and they went in continually over and over and over again. Because in verse number two, he's actually making a point based on that fact. And that is that they had to keep going in there. And what was the purpose? Because they weren't able to take their sins away. Now, if the lamb or if the sacrifices that they were, were taking in and offering, if they were effective, if they did have power to take away sins and to give forgiveness, then they would have only had to go into the holiest of all one time. They would have only had to go in there one time and offer that lamb or offer that ram one time and it would have been totally finished. Because it says afterwards, because that the worshipers once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. So it's saying that if they were able to go in there and offer it one time, and if it was able to take away their sins, then they wouldn't have had to continually go in and offer them. Another thing that you can learn from this is because it's, what it's doing is it's contrasting it with Christ again as being our sacrifice. Because, of course, Christ was offered once and for all, and actually uses that statement here in Hebrews 10. And it's comparing how they went in year by year continually, and Christ offered himself one time. Notice the statement that it makes. Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Now how many times is Christ offered? Is he offered year by year continually? No. He's offered one time for everyone, right? So what does that mean? If, it's, if he's offered, according to verse number 2, if he's offered one time for everyone and he takes away our sins, what does that mean about us? We are what? We are purged. According to verse number 2. Because the only reason it says, the, the reason why if they would have been able to just offer it one time and never offer it again, it would have, the Bible says that they would have been purged from their sins if that would have been that way. But because it wasn't able to purge them from their sins, they had to continually offer it. Well, what does that mean that Christ does for us the fact that he only offered himself once? That means that we are once purged. We have been purged from our sins. That We don't need Him to continually offer for our sins because He paid for all of our sins from the beginning of time to the end of time. Every man that's ever lived. goes on to verse number 3. It says, But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Verse 4. For, that means because, this is why there's a remembrance, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Now that's an extremely powerful verse. And you know, obviously a lot of dispensationalists out there, even people that don't even fall into the category of hyper dispensationalism, you know, they believe that the, that people were, you know, saved by faith, you know, uh, in the Old Testament. They still had kind of bizarre and, and these kind of sub teachings along with that of how the how and why the uh, lambs and the goats were offered. Now that verse is extremely clear. The Bible is extremely clear that it is not possible for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. It, blood, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. They can do nothing for your sin. When they offer that, a, a lamb did not sin. You know, human beings sinned. So in order to be just, what has to take the punishment? 
A human being has to take the punishment. So it wouldn't make sense to have a lamb die in your place. You're not a lamb. So in order to be perfectly just, obviously, God had to become a man. He had to become a man because you're a man, and man is who deserved the punishment. Mankind is who sinned and broke His commandments and broke His law. So it tells you it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Now, if you bring this verse up to a dispensationalist, if you ever have this, this conversation with them, I'm going to show you how to counter this and explain this to them so they can learn the error of their way doctrinally. They'll often say, yes, they cannot take away sin, but what they did is cover your sin. Uh, they, they, they don't take your, way, your, your sin away entirely. Only Christ can do that. But what happens is the blood of bulls and of goats just covered their sin temporarily and then these people that died during that time period, they would go to Abraham's bosom. And then they stayed in Abraham's bosom and their sin was just covered. So they, they didn't go to hell, their sin's covered, it's a temporary thing. But then Christ came and He died on the cross for their sin and then He actually took their sin away. Now. This chapter and nowhere ever does it talk about how the blood of bulls and of goats cover your sin. And I'm actually going to show you that if you look up that phrase, cover sins or cover their sin, it teaches the exact opposite. I want you to go to Romans chapter number 4. We're going to come back to where we're at here. Romans chapter number 4. Romans chapter number 4. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 4 is speaking about, you know, it's, it's, it's teaching us about our salvation by Abraham's salvation because we're saved the same way. It's teaching us about David's salvation because we're saved the same way. We, you know, it goes from Abraham to David. But I want you to notice that it makes a statement. I want you to look with me at verse number 6. It says, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Then it goes on in verse 7 and says this, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, now watch this, and whose sins are covered. So what does it mean to have your sins covered? According to David and according to Romans 4, 8. It means to have your iniquities forgiven. He just, he just repeats the same thing. So in order to have your iniquities forgiven is the same thing as having your sins forgiven covered. It's exactly the same thing. What it's saying is you're, you know, I've covered that debt. I've paid for it. You have nothing to worry about. You know, I'll cover it. You know, let's say if you know, two people go out to eat, right? And one person has a debt, just like how we have our, our you know, the wages of sin is death, right? That is our debt. If one person, you know, is like, hey, I don't have any money. And the other person says, hey, don't worry about it. I'll cover it. What do they mean? They're saying, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to remove your debt, right? Well, that's exactly the same thing. That's what it means to cover our sins. It means for our iniquities to be forgiven. That it's not held against us any longer. So he says there in verse number eight, uh, uh, verse number seven, saying, "Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin." So he will not put sin on your account. These are all the same. It's the same type of language when we're speaking of covering or imputing. It's the language of, of a, a, a legality of owing someone a debt. I want you to go back to Hebrews chapter number 10. Now, no dispensationalist would look at Romans chapter number 4 and argue that that is speaking about and teaching us about salvation by grace through faith, right? The gospel of Paul, like they would refer to it as. And that is when you look up the word covered and you look up it covering sin or covering iniquity, you look up these types of things, that's, that is the, the, the prime example. You know, it uses it uh, also a couple of times, I believe. Uh, I can't remember if it's cover transgression or cover iniquity. But it comes up, it appears a couple other times in the New Testament. And you know what it's talking about? Jesus Christ's blood covering. And that's how we'll speak today, even casually in language, how Jesus Christ's blood covered all of our sin. Does that mean that we still need someone to come and remove the sin? Of course not. That's ridiculous. What we mean by that Jesus' blood covered our sin is that Jesus' blood took care of it. He forgave it. He paid for it. That His blood was enough. 
So when we look here in Hebrews chapter number 10 and it says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin, it's saying that it's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats can cover our sin. It's actually saying the exact same thing. Because in order to take away our sin is to forgive us of our sin, to take away our debt, or to cover our debt. That's what it's meaning. So it's this foolish word game. You know, it's funny because dispensationalists, you know, are, are the ones that really, you know, tout themselves as being the Bible believers. And we take everything so literally. That phrase or that type of teaching isn't found anywhere in the Bible. That all oh, the blood of the blood of bulls and of goats and the sacrifice, they just cover their sin temporarily. You don't have a single teaching where that wording or anything like that occurs anywhere. It's the only way that they can hang on to the dispensationalism and, and Abraham's bosom. It's their way to try to explain away difficult passages instead of being a, an actual Bible student and looking the words up and comparing Scripture with Scripture. So what does it mean to take away sins? It means to cover sins. It means to forgive us of our sins and know bull, no goat, no lamb, anything like that can ever forgive you of your sin. It can never cover your sin. It can never take away your sin. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can do that. Look at verse number 5. Wherefore, so because the, the, the bulls and goats can't take away your sin, wherefore when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Now, we can learn a very relevant truth from this verse of this stupid teaching from Stephen Anderson of, you know, that he's eternally had a, a, a flesh and a, a bone body. He's always had, he's eternally had a body, referring to Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 5. Wherefore, watch this, when he cometh into the world, talking about when Jesus came and was born into this world, when he was born a man, right? When he became a man. When he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. So this is like Jesus prophetically speaking to God, and he's saying, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, saying you don't want that. Why? Because they can't take away sin. Now look what it says. But a body hast thou prepared me. So notice that it says, but, contrast that, a body hast thou prepared me. How can you prepare something for someone if they've always had it? How can you prepare something for someone if they've eternally already had it? There would be no availability for a stage of preparation. If the person always had it, he couldn't prepare it for him. Now that makes no sense at all. You would have to, if he's eternally had a body, at what point did he prepare it and how in which did he prepare it? That makes zero sense. Notice that it is pointing towards a time in which a body was given to him and he set this up. Why? Because this was, uh, this was planned in the mind of God from all eternity. That God would become a man himself and that, he, he, you know, obviously that is his son. He establishes this relationship. He's able to, to hold this relationship with God as a man while on earth and he planned that he the man Christ Jesus, the Son of God, would that body that was given to him die on the cross with it and pay for the sins of the whole world. Amen. And he prepared the body for him. It is logically impossible to word this this way and, that all, and to also try to hold the, the teaching or, go, or, or, or come about this conclusion with this conclusion that he always had the body. No, he prepared the body for him. And when? When he came into the world. At the time in which he came into the world, that's the purpose that he prepared the body for him. So when does it point towards? It points towards the time when he was conceived and then he was born on this earth as a man. He was given a flesh and bone body. That's why, you know, the Bible says, Jesus says, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, of the spirit comes the spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. When did Jesus Christ have a flesh and, and bone body, a flesh and blood body? When he was born of Mary because she's flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now, he's also 100% God. That's why it says that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So he had to have come forth from flesh at some point in order to have a flesh and bone body or in order to have a flesh and blood body. And God prepared that for him because he predestined that Christ would come and be born and die on the cross as a physical man and take the sin of man. This was planned from all eternity, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So that's what we see here when it says he prepared the body. That we can see that 
this verse alone is a great verse that debunks this stupid, idiotic teaching that supposedly Jesus Christ has eternally possessed this, this flesh and blood body. He's always been a man. Eternally, he's been a man. It's ridiculous. It defies scriptures all throughout the Bible. Look at verse number uh, 6. It says this, In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Now, I want you to notice that. This is reiterating the same point. He had no pleasure. Were they able to take away sins? No. Were they able to forgive sins? No. How much pleasure did he have in it? Did it at least cover it for a period of time? And he took them away later? None. Zero pleasure. They didn't, there was zero efficacy. Nothing. It didn't help at all. They weren't effective at all. He had no pleasure. And it says this, Then said I, Lo, I come. And then it says, in, in, uh, parenthetically there, In the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Now, so obviously it's prophetic of the Lord Jesus Christ coming. And what's written there in the parentheses is very interesting. I love studying the Bible and just trying to find Jesus Christ all throughout the Bible. You know, that's one of the things that attests to the fact that this is such a divine book. The way in which all the figures and the pictures work together and they so precisely and repeatedly point to Jesus over and over again. And it's not things that are just, point, that are, that are just uh, blatantly laid out. The things that you have to study and compare Scripture with Scripture, and you have to be able to read between the lines and comparing these things together. But when you lay them out, it's always the same patterns over and over again. And they're always very, in, in great specific detail pointing towards Jesus. All the different events, like you look at Joseph, you know, the, the 20 pieces of silver, the 30 pieces of silver, the vesture dipped in blood. You know, he's, he's at the right hand of Pharaoh. I mean, it's just over and over and over again. And that's what this is referring to. It says, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. And uh, notice it says, the book. What, is the, what, what does Bible mean? The, the, the Bible, actually a lot of people don't know that, but the word Bible means book. That's all that it means. It's just, you know, it just means book. Uh, uh, you know, in, in a lot of languages, what is it uh, in Spanish? It's Biblia, right? It's, that's just the word for book, the average word that they use in Spanish for book. That's all that it means. Uh, Bible, all it means is book. That's why I refer to it as the holy book. It's the divine book. So that's what Jesus is saying here in the volume of the book it is written of me. It is the book, right? It's definite article. It's a set apart book. That's what holy means. It's a book that's unlike any other book. It's God's book. It's God's word. You know, every other book is written by men. This book, yes, men penned it down, but it didn't come from the heart of man. It came from the heart of God. God guided, you know, the, the, the pen and, and manipulated the pen and put, put down exactly his word and what we could learn from it. Notice it says in the volume. What is, the, what is the volume of something? It's the substance. It's everything in it, isn't it? So he's saying, when he says, the volume of the book, it is written of me, he's saying the whole thing. Everything. Actually, go to the book of Luke quickly, if you don't mind. Go to the book of Luke. We'll see this being repeated in the book of Luke. It's actually first spoken by, and it's spoken by the same person, because that is prophetically Jesus speaking. <clears throat> go to Luke chapter number 24, and look with me at... Uh, Look with me at verse number 25. It says, then, then he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking unto the, the two men uh, on the road to Emmaus. One of them is Cleopas and the other man is uh, anonymous. It says in verse 25, then, then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then it says this, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, notice that, all, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Notice all over and over and over again. It's stressing and emphasizing the fact that he went through the entire Bible. And what did Jesus say? Lo, in the volume of the book it is written to me. All the prophets, all the scriptures. Luke chapter number 24. Look, this is repeated again. Look over at verse number 44. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all the things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding and they might, that they might understand the scriptures. So notice, again, he went through all of them and all the prophecies, all the scriptures, because the whole Bible is pointing toward Jesus. Just like how we looked at in Hebrews chapter number 9, the very beginning, we looked at some of the different uh, uh, you know, uh, instruments and the different things that were laid out in the tabernacle. And 
and what was to be put there, the showbread, all of it ends up pointing to Jesus. Every bit of it. The light, Jesus is the light of the world. The bread, Jesus is the bread of life. The volume. When he says that, it's the volume, he actually means the volume. He means all of it. Every bit of it points to Jesus Christ. He receives all the glory. It's all about him. The reason why we come to church is for Jesus. All of our lives should be you know, centered around pleasing Jesus and doing what he wants us to do. That's what we should. We should be sacrificing our lives for Christ. We should be doing everything that we should. So just like the whole Bible points to Jesus, our lives should point to Jesus. Just like the whole Bible is about Jesus, our our lives and, 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 and everything that we do should in some way point back and be centered around the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's all about Him. Uh, verse number 8. Above, when He said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure, th pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said He, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that He may establish the second. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ said even when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was struggling in the flesh. Remember, he made the statement. He said, not my will, but thine be done. Right? So notice what it says here prophetically. Written in the Old Testament. He says, I come to do thy will, O God. And then it goes on and says, he taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Now, who took away the first that he may establish the second? Of course, Jesus Christ is the one that did that. So he had to remove the first covenant in order to put the second covenant into place. Look back at Hebrews chapter number 8, verse number 13. It tells us, In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So the fact that he put a new covenant in place made the other one the old covenant. And what happens with something that's old? It's gone. It vanishes away, right? It corrupts. So the point is that he's replacing it. So he took away the first that he may establish the, the second. So over and over and over again, and, and, and uh, specifically in Hebrews chapter number 8, you know, I spoke a lot about how the old covenant is done at, in uh, you know, this time period today. It's done for. It's not active any longer. So the covenant that was made, and who was it specifically made with? The nation of Israel. And today, of course, people want to, uh, you know, they still uh, uh, teach and they still preach. They still practice, you know, donating and things like that. As though the nation of Israel is God's chosen people. That was contingent upon the old covenant. He told them that if you keep all of my commandments, if you keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar people. So notice, if, then. Right? So you, there's a condition and then there is a result. That's what that's referred to as. There's a condition and then a result. If you do not fulfill this condition, then this result will not come about. Well, that whole old covenant is gone. It's done away with. It says, one more time, he taketh away the first. He taketh away the first. So, you know, there are errors with what is taught as replacement theology. You know, the, the standard view of replacement theology has issues and has errors with it. But is it incorrect just to use that statement to say that the first, that the new covenant replaced the old? Not at all. This is a perfect example of that. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. So notice, there's a covenant. And he takes away that covenant, and what does he do? He establishes a new covenant. So what just took place? He replaced it. That's exactly what happened. The old covenant is not active. The old covenant is done away with. God does not deal differently with the Jews today than he does the, you know, Gentiles or whatever you would say. He doesn't deal differently with one group of people than he does the other. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither bond nor free. There, it doesn't matter to Jesus. That doesn't matter at all. So, is it true to say, is that, a, is that a wording correct to say that, hey, he took away the old covenant and he put a new covenant in its place? Yeah, technically it is. The old covenant's gone, and then he put a new covenant in it. You know, Jesus Christ told the Jews, he said, the kingdom shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. They are replaced. They are no longer God's chosen people. So the nation, the physical nation of Israel, is no longer God's chosen people today. And they don't even have the opportunity because the covenant is gone. They don't have even the chance. 
That's why Jesus, when he told the parable, he said, last of all, he sent his son. Amen. That was their last opportunity. And what did they do? They failed. They crucified Jesus. They said, we have no king but Caesar. That's it. That, they were done. They hung him on a cross. The old covenant's done away with. That was the institution right then at that moment. So if you think about it, it's very interesting because at the very moment in which the old covenant ended, the new covenant began. Why? Because it says, last of all, he sent his son. So what was their last opportunity? The way in which they dealt with Jesus. That was the deciding factor of the old covenant. Where did that end? Jesus on the cross. Because that was their rejection. Where does the new covenant begin? Jesus on the cross. So notice right there where the transition takes place is at the exact same moment in history, if you will. At the exact same moment where they reject him is the exact same moment where the new covenant came into place. So is the old covenant still active? If they did you know, turn back to God today as a physical nation, would the old covenant even apply to them? No. No, it's been taken away. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. So that he could establish the second. In order, for the old, in order for the new covenant to be put into place and to be activated, the old covenant had to go away. That's why it happened all at the same time. It makes perfect sense. He replaced it. That's exactly what took place. Look at verse number 10. By the which will we are sanctified. So when the, the, the new covenant went into place, that's what sanctified us. And what was it? It was, by the, it was by his death, by the blood of Jesus. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Look at this. Once for all. He only died one time. Jesus Christ died one time, paid for the sins of the whole world. His blood was so powerful, the sinless blood that was pumping through his body, you know, the, the, the blood of God, the blood of the eternal creator. It was so powerful that it was just one death. That's all that it took, and he covered the sins. He could justly forgive every single person that ever had transgressed the holy moral law that had ever lived Amen. by one death. And it says, once for all, every person. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. So right here, verses uh, uh, 1 through 11, it's just over and over again explaining that the Old Testament sacrifices, the Old Covenant offerings weren't able to take away sins. But the New Covenant offering, the New Covenant sacrifice of Jesus Christ through His body was able to take away our sins. Amen. Verse number 12, but this man, see how it keeps contrasting them. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So notice that. And notice how it emphasizes he's a man. Because it first pointed out in every priest who were men. Jesus is our high priest, which has to be a man. That's what we need to be our mediator. That's why it emphasizes that. So every word in the Bible matters. It says, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, obviously of himself, for sins forever. I use that statement oftentimes when I'm out soul winning. I'll say, you know, the Bible tells us that Jesus died for the sins of forever. He died for the sins of all eternity. Any sin that's ever been committed by man anywhere, he died for it. Amen. Sat down on the right hand of God. So what's that point there? I'm saying that he, he's done. He's finished. He was able to rest. That's the point. That's why it's emphasizing that. He was done. He sat down on the right hand of God and it was finished. It was completed. And while they just kept going in over and over again. Seems like a lot of wasted time, doesn't it? Just over and over again offering these sins that were not able to... I'm sorry, offering these sacrifices that were not able to take away their sins. Look at verse number 13 now. From henceforth, that means from here on or here forward, expecting. And that's... Uh, expecting there is like waiting. Uh, anticipating, that, you know, like an expectation, till his enemies be made his footstool. So he's expecting, it means he's waiting, but he's kind of, uh, you know, an expectation is something you're anticipating as in you are desiring it, right? So he's looking forward to it. So that's the next thing, is when his enemies are made his footstool. Look at verse 14. For by one offering 
He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, He paid for the sins of all of mankind. And anyone that puts their faith in Him, they are perfected through Him. Every single person that is sanctified and every single person that has been forgiven and that will be in heaven, those people are in heaven by Jesus Christ. Amen. It says, notice it, perfected forever them that are sanctified. So I think everyone would agree that people that get to go to heaven are sanctified. Everyone would agree that the person that gets into heaven, they've been perfected. Well, if you have been perfected, if you have been sanctified, you are perfected and you are sanctified by Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what time period you are living in. It doesn't, nothing else matters. The way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So them that are sanctified and perfected, they go by Jesus Christ. That's the only way. It's not by offering a lamb. It's not by your own works. It's by Jesus. Look at verse 15. Where, whereof, so of this, the sanctification, I want you to notice that, whereof. That's referring back to the sanctification, the fact that they were sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. Now this is going to tie in with what we looked at in Hebrews 9. Or I'm sorry, Hebrews 8. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So this is, of course, the, the quotation back to the book of Jeremiah. And if you flip over to, uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter number 8, I want you to look with me at verse number 10. It was Jeremiah chapter number 31. But uh, here in uh, Hebrews chapter number 8 is where this is repeated again. And it tells you, For this is the covenant that I will make with the, with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. So that actually quotes a little bit more of that particular uh, uh, citation of the Old Testament. So it's quoting the exact same place, Jeremiah chapter number 31. But here in verse number 15, we're given a little bit more information. And it's the fact that how he is writing this in our hearts and how he is putting it in our minds is through the Holy Ghost. It's through the Holy Spirit. By us receiving the Holy Ghost and receiving the Holy Spirit, he sanctifies us and he's put his righteousness. Because, of course, the Holy Ghost is righteous. It is God's Spirit. So he gives that to us, and now we have been imputed righteousness. Our soul receives the Holy Spirit, and we are receiving His righteousness. It is the Lord's righteousness, and that is His law. Now, the perfect keeping of the law of Jesus Christ, Christ's Spirit, is in our hearts and in our minds. So notice two things go on. It says that He gives us the Holy Spirit, and by that He sanctifies us. But He also, it says, verse number 17, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So notice that we don't need another offering. We don't need another sacrifice. He's offered one time for the sins forever. One time. And once he does that, it's done. Just like he was talking about the, the, the sacrifices, if they were able to purge you, if they were once purged, then there would be no more need of a sacrifice. There would be no need of another offering. But Jesus Christ, because he was able to purge us, and what does it mean to be purged? Purge is a stronger word for cleaning, saying it's completely clean. It's just, a, it's just a more specific word to say completely clean. That's what it means to purge something, right? When someone's purging something, it, what it does is it creates a picture in your mind of like squeezing it out. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're getting it all out. So you could say, hey, I'm going to clean this, right? I'm going to clean this out or I'm going to clean house. Let's say that like when people are maybe like firing people or something at, at, at you know, uh, uh, some sort of place of work or business. We're going to clean house because they're having problems, right? A stronger word would be like, we're going to purge this out. That means we're going to more, more so diligently clean out all of the problems or get rid of all the people that are maybe you know, doing things bad or not hard workers or whatever it may be, right? So it's saying they're going to purge it right here. It's saying that, he, that, that our sins are purged. What does it mean once purged? It's saying Jesus paid for all of it. 100% completely paid for all of our sins. He cleansed us. Now, were the sacrifices and offerings able to do that? No. No, Jesus was able to do it. So once he purges us... That is him, you know, getting rid of our sins and iniquities. And he says, I will he says, will I remember no more? Speaking of our sins and iniquities. He says, will I remember no more? Now, it further points that out right here in verse number 18. Now where remission of these is, 
There is no more offering for sin. So notice that he's, he's stressing the, the efficacy. That's just like the, the effectiveness, right? The efficacy of this offering, of Jesus Christ's offering. It's saying once you have had your sins remitted, right? Once your sins have been taken away through this offering, once this offering is applied unto your account, there is no more offering for sin. You don't need another offering. They don't, you don't need to continually get resaved. You don't need to continually, you know, you know, take a drink of the water of life, right? You don't need to continually do this. I was telling Brother Rick about this the other day. I believe it was Brother Rick and I were talking about this. You know, I, I remember my pastor was talking about when he, right when he, you know, had gotten saved. Uh, you know, my pastor for, for many years that I learned from, Pastor Dave. He was telling me about right when he had gotten saved, he wanted to learn how to go soul winning real bad. So he started going soul winning a little, a little bit. And, uh, you know, it was sometimes, you know, uh, um, you know, productive and sometimes not. Sometimes people were receptive and sometimes not. You know, sometimes you go through these little, these times where... <clears throat> People, or it's just a lot of people that are just unreceptive. And it can become discouraging, and even more so especially if you're new at it. So he's learning soul winning from somebody, he's going soul winning, and he's noticing how unreceptive sometimes it can be. And I think he went through in the very beginning a pretty dry spell of you know, unreceptiveness. Well, he had a guy that he worked with. And this guy that he worked with, he didn't know, the, the, you know anything about the guy. He just knew the guy was a Christian. And this guy kept talking about every week how he's like, you know, man, there's... 15 people got saved this week. And then he came back the next week and he's like, 22 people got saved this week. And he came back the next week and he's like, another 17 people got saved this week. And, and you know, Pastor Dave, you know, he's, he's obviously not the pastor at this time, but he's going soul and he's trying to learn how to go soul and he's hungry for souls. He's wanting to get people saved. He's thinking, you know, we're not hardly getting anybody saved in our church. He's like, you know, one person, like, because, you know, they give altar calls and stuff. Maybe one person every three months goes up to the altar and then we're getting, you know, you know, one person a week or, you know, one person every other week saved that soul. And he's like, what are we doing wrong that these people are doing right? And the guy came back and told him again, like, man, we got like, you know, there was like 25 people that came up to the altar and got saved this week. And he's like, really? He's like, man, you know, you know, what's going on? You know, what's the, what kind of church do you go to? And it's some sort of new faith Pentecostal church. He found out there's only like 50 or 60 members in the entire church or 70 members. You know, that's the part I was, that, that tied in with bro, what Brother Rick and I were talking about. So there's like 60 or 70 members in this church. And what's going on are these people are continually going up to the altar. The same people are every single week or every other week going back up to this altar. And they think they're getting re-saved. That's what they think. They think they're going up, up to this altar and they've lost their salvation. They haven't been good enough. You know, and they just need to go back up there and just ask Jesus one more time to save them. And maybe this time, maybe his blood will be powerful enough to cleanse them or to purge them from all their sin. That is not the right well of water. The, the right and correct well of water is a well that will be in your heart and in your spirit of, of eternal life springing up for all eternity. You remember when, uh, go to John chapter number 4 and let's look at that. And we're going to end here in just a moment. That's the last verse that we will that we will uh, that we will read in Hebrews. So we'll end here in John chapter number four because this is what all of Hebrews chapter number ten is about. Hebrews chapter number ten is about the unprofitableness of the sacrifices of the law or of the old covenant and the profitableness of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. I want you to notice here in John chapter number four. Look at verse number 10. This is Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman. And he says, it says, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Verse 12. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped verse 11. Sorry about that. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? So she's, of course, not saved. She's not spiritually discerned. So she's thinking he's speaking about a physical well of water. 
while it, wherein he is uh, actually speaking about a spiritual well of water. Look at verse number 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. So notice that he says, if you drink of this physical well of water, you're going to thirst again. You're going to have to come back again and have another drink of this well and of this water. Then he says this, verse 14, but, so this is different, this is being contrasted, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So I want you to notice that Jesus' well of water is a well of water that you only drink from one time. And once you drink of it, you never thirst again. And it's sad that in these churches where they don't have the right gospel, and notice that Jesus said to the woman, he said, if thou knewest the gift of God, and that's what these people don't know. They don't know that it's a gift. They think that they have to work for it. They think that they have to earn it. They think that it's by their own merit. And every single week, because they're not good enough, they try to come back to that well of water, but they're going to the wrong well. They're not going to the well where, where the water is. It'll be springing up in your heart unto everlasting life. That's the right well. That's the well that Jesus has, and it's a gift. And once you go there and you drink of it, just drink of it one time, you'll never thirst again. Now, if you had to get resaved, or if you had to go back to that well, this would make no sense. You know why? Because then Jesus' well would be exactly the same as the physical well of water. You would have had to go back to it and you would have thirsted. But the uh, uh, defining characteristic between the two wells, the physical well of water and Jesus' well, is that Jesus' well is a well of water that you only drink from one time and you'll never thirst again. You just, you just drink of it one time, you get saved one time, you receive the gift one time, and you'll never th thirst again. Why? Because Jesus purges you completely. Amen. And there's no need for another sacrifice. Right. There's no need for Jesus to be offered again. He offered himself one time for the sins of forever and he was done. That's good. You know what he did? He sat down on the right hand of God. He sat down on the right hand of God. So what, you know, what Hebrews chapter number 10, what's the point of Hebrews chapter number 10 is to stress the power of Christ's blood by comparing it under these sacrifices that every year they're coming in there and offering these sacrifices. Every year. And there's no profitableness. Do you know what those sacrifices were like? The physical well of water. They're just like the physical well of water. They're just, they're just of this world. They're not spiritual. You know what they needed? They needed was the true offering. They needed the offering of Christ. Because once a worshiper is once purged, there's no more offering of sin. Once you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're sanctified. You know? And what are you sanctified by? The Holy Ghost. You're given the Holy Spirit. That's Christ's righteousness. And you know what else happens? God said, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Notice that. It's stressing what? The eternality. It's stressing that once it applies to you, once you know, this blood applies to your account, once you are taking part in the new covenant, do you know what's going on? Your, all of your sins have been forgiven. 100% forgiven. And you're given the righteousness of God, which is the Holy Ghost. That's how you're sanctified. That's what that covenant is referring to as we looked at Sunday evening. That sanctification that takes place, that's the promise of the Spirit. That covenant that God promised would come one day, that's of the Holy Ghost. That's of the Holy Spirit. So, go to, actually go back to Hebrews. I want to read two more verses that are somewhat not uh, connected to this subject because it starts to shift and I think it would be perfect to be able to pick up, as I said, seamlessly next week. I want to look here at Hebrews chapter number 10 because it concludes, it actually uses the word therefore in verse number 19. So let's conclude this in verse number uh, 20, or I'm sorry, 19 and 20. It says this, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So that's talking about us saying that we can now enter into the holiest. Why? Because Jesus hath made us kings and priests. His life is imputed unto us. We become sons of God. We also become priests. Now we are also able to go into the holiest of all by what? 
Because we're, we're bringing in the blood of Jesus with us. Our hearts have been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus so we can walk into and we can come into the presence of God. What does it mean, brethren, having boldness? Why should we have boldness? Once it sinks down into your ears and once you understand the powerfulness of Christ's blood, how powerful Christ's blood is, that should give you boldness. Amen. That should cause you to be bold when you pray to God. Because we have some, something so powerful. You know, what would cause you not to be bold? You'd be ashamed of your sin, right? And you know what? When we sin, a great sin against the Lord, we should be ashamed of it. But you know what we also need to remember and keep in our mind? That Jesus Christ's blood is more powerful than all of our sin. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That His blood is, is far more powerful than any of our sin. And when we sin, yes, we need to repent of it. We need to get that right. You know, but once we go to the Lord, we can still go in boldness. When we pray to God, we can pray in boldness because we're praying. We're praying uh, to the Lord after our hearts have been sprinkled by His blood. Understanding how powerful His blood is. Verse number 20 and when? By a new and living way. This is the new covenant. A, a, a living way. It's, it's spiritual. It's alive. Which He hath consecrated for us. So He sanctified this for us. He did this for us. Through the veil, and it says, that is to say, his flesh. So what did that veil represent? I know I went over this in Hebrews chapter number 9 in the Old Testament. That veil that separated. What was the presence of God? How do we get to... to I want you to think about this. How do, where was the presence of God in the Old Testament tabernacle? It was in the holiest of all. It was in the second part of the tabernacle, right? And I'm, I'm sure everyone understanding and knowing that's the presence of God. Those that yearned after God's presence, those that desired to know God and to be with God and to, 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 to know Him, have a relationship with Him, I'm sure they desired to go into there. They desired to have that, you know, that closeness with God and to be in the presence of God. But there was something that was separating them. There was something that was causing them at that time not to be able to get into the presence of God. What brings us to God? How do we get to God? Right? So that would be the Father. There's one God, the Father. That is the presence of God within the holiest of all, seated upon the throne. And how do we get there? What do we have to go through? We have to go through the veil. You know what we have to go through? We have to go through God's flesh. That's what we have to go through. Again, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know what? Anyone that went into the presence of God, do you know how they got there? Through the veil. Amen. Anyone that gets to heaven, do you know how they get there? They get there through the veil. They get there through the flesh. They get there through the man, Christ Jesus. That's how they get there. So, everything's pointing to Christ. Every aspect is pointing to Christ. Every aspect of, of, of the whole Bible, Hebrews chapter number 10, the whole book of Hebrews is comparing the Old Covenant, the New Covenant. Old Testament Scriptures, the New Testament Scriptures. But it always keeps having the same theme over and over and over again. That Jesus Christ is greater than than anything you want to compare them unto. Jesus Christ was a greater sacrifice unto the, you know, uh, being compared unto the Old Testament sacrifices. If anyone's going to get to heaven, if anyone's sanctified, it's going to be through the Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone goes into the presence of God, those that go to the Father, those that go to God, how do they get there? Through the veil. They get there through the flesh. They get there through the man, Christ Jesus. So let's bow our head and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you so much for the depth of the Bible. Uh, we ask you that you'd be with us, dear Lord. You'd bless our church. Bless all the prayer requests, please. Uh, those that have infirmities, dear Lord, uh, give us unity in the church. Uh, we ask you, dear God, that uh, you would uh, bless all the families that are here tonight. Uh, help us all to, uh, to love your word, to read it every day, to study it, to meditate upon it, to think about it. Give everyone here a, 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 a special blessing of just understanding the word of God so that we can grow in knowledge. Uh, give us all here just zeal for your word that we might love it till the day that we die and that it would, it would, it would push us just to live a clean, righteous life and to, and to dedicate our lives and to do works for you. We love you. We're very thankful for your sacrifice. Help us to revere your blood and to understand understand what you went through and, and uh, the significance of it and how holy and divine that it is. We love you as I said and in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. amen.